Hi there. If you're watching this, you may be considering converting to Islam, and it may seem like a good idea to you at the moment. After all, you've probably been told that the word Islam means submission, and that this simply refers to submission to God. If you believe in God, why wouldn't you want to submit to Him? Makes sense, right? Not so fast. There are two main reasons you should slow down and think about this a bit more carefully. First, according to the Quran, you can only submit to Allah by fully submitting to all of the decisions of Muhammad. In chapter 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah declares, But know, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them, and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions, and accept them with full submission. Notice, you can have no real Islamic faith until you make Muhammad judge in all disputes, and you find no resistance in yourself against any of his decisions. You have to accept Muhammad's decisions with full submission. So, while the word Islam does mean submission, it's really the religion of submission to a man, because according to the Quran, you can only submit to Allah by submitting to Muhammad. Who was Muhammad? He was an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord. As a rule, before you unquestioningly accept all of the teachings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord, you should really, really make sure you can trust him as a prophet. And that requires carefully examining his life and teachings, along with the so-called evidences of his prophethood. The second reason you should proceed with caution here is that Muhammad ordered his followers to execute anyone who leaves Islam. For instance, in Sunan An-Nasai 4067, we read, The Messenger of Allah said, Whoever changes his religion, kill him. So, if you convert to Islam without doing any careful research, and you later decide to leave Islam, you'll be under a death sentence for the rest of your life. Islamic preachers will send you threats, warning you that, once they're in power, you'll be executed. This is a part of our religion, there's a reason to it, yeah? There's a reason why there's a capital punishment. Because people like you, little weaklings, who leave their religion and cause uh, corruption in the land by spreading it, the capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you. We have no doubt, and we're proud of that, yeah? Capital punishment will be applied in an Islamic state, yeah? Converting to Islam isn't like joining a club that you can simply leave once you change your mind. It's something that follows you forever through threats of violence. If you're going to convert to a religion that will sentence you to death for changing your mind, here again, you should make sure you understand what you're getting into and why you're getting into it. So, why are you considering converting to Islam? Do you have a Muslim friend who's trying to convince you to convert? Has someone been sending you videos filled with amazing proofs that Islam is true? Did you bother to carefully examine these proofs that were presented to you? Did you look up the references? Did you research responses to these arguments? No, you didn't. Because if you had carefully examined the arguments for Islam, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. You wouldn't be thinking about converting. What would you find if you took a closer look at any of these arguments for Islam? Muslim preachers and apologists claim that the Quran is filled with amazing scientific insights that couldn't possibly have been known in the 7th century. Do yourself a favor. Look up the verses and see what they actually say. They never say what the Muslim preachers and apologists claim they say. Islamic preachers take extremely vague verses that aren't saying anything scientific, and they insert modern science into these extremely vague verses and claim that the verses are making scientific claims. The reason they have to go to vague verses is that all of the clear scientific claims in the Quran are completely wrong. For instance, the Quran claims very clearly that the sun sets in a muddy pool. 
In a passage about the travels of someone named Dhul Karnain, usually thought to be Alexander the Great, we read in verses 85 to 86 of chapter 18, So he followed away, until, when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black, muddy, or hot water, and he found near it a people. The Quran claims that the sun sets in a muddy pool, which means that the sun is much smaller than the earth, and that there are people who live there. If you ask your Muslim friends about this, they'll tell you that you have to reinterpret the passage. They'll say that the Quran is only claiming that Dhul-Karnain saw a reflection in a pool of water and that it appeared to him as if the sun were setting in that pool. The problem with this reinterpretation is that Muhammad himself claimed that the sun sets in a pool of water. Sunan Abu Daud, 4002. It was narrated that Abu Dar said, I was riding behind the Messenger of Allah while he was on a donkey, and the sun was setting. He said, Do you know where this sun sets? I said, Allah and his Messenger know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. There's nothing about Dhul Karnain here, so this can't be referring to something Dhul Karnain saw. This is Muhammad telling his companions what happens to the sun when it sets. Like Allah in the Quran, Muhammad claims that the sun sets in a pool of water. You'll find these kinds of things all over the Quran. The Quran claims that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs, that the earth is flat, that there are seven earths, that the sun orbits the earth, that human embryos are blood clots, that the sky would fall on the earth if Allah didn't hold it up, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons who try to sneak into heaven. Did your Muslim friend bother telling you any of this? Here again, if you bring up these verses to a Muslim preacher, he'll tell you that you have to reinterpret them. Notice, you have to reinterpret all of the clear scientific claims of the Quran because they're all wrong. Then you have to insert modern science into hopelessly vague verses in order to get the scientific miracle. Is this a good reason to submit to all of the decisions of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord? Perhaps you've been told about the miraculous preservation of the Quran. There's only one Quran, perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time of Muhammad. Let me guess, whoever told you about the miraculous preservation of the Quran didn't bother telling you that, according to Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were lost because Muhammad's companions were too lazy to recite them. He didn't bother telling you that hundreds of verses were lost because the only people who had them memorized died in battle. He didn't bother telling you that verses were eaten by a sheep. He definitely didn't show you Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. Those verses were part of the Quran. They're not in the Quran today. What happened to them? Muhammad's wife Aisha had the only copy, and a sheep ate it. So Allah couldn't protect the Quran from a sheep. According to Muslim sources, Uthman III of the rightly guided caliphs had to burn countless copies of the Quran to cover up all the differences. And even that didn't work because there are still different versions of the Quran even today. Muslim scholars are now being forced to admit that there are different versions of the Quran. And today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text uh, that uh, is referred to as the Egyptian edition uh, of 1924. Uh, but this is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. In other words, if you were to compare two printed Qurans, 
you're going to see differences between them. And this is something that many people are unaware of and many people have heard but are not fully familiar with, especially those who have been exposed to uh, some of our brothers who live in Algeria or Morocco or other North African countries. They recite the Qur'an in a slightly different way. Not just a voice or not just a, a, a speaking style, but also changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. On what planet is this a good reason to make an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord the ultimate authority on everything you think or do? Perhaps your Muslim friend told you that Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. But he forgot to mention that Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent 9-year-old girl named Aisha. He forgot to tell you that Muhammad had sex with his slave girls. He forgot to tell you that Muhammad allowed his followers to beat their wives into submission and to rape their female captives and to hire prostitutes. Perhaps your Muslim friend told you that Islam must be true because it's spreading so rapidly. I have no idea why something growing rapidly would mean that it's true, but I bet your friend didn't tell you why Islam is growing so rapidly. The same Pew Research study that said that Islam is the world's fastest growing religion also said that the primary reason for Islam's rapid growth is high birth rates. Why do Muslims have higher birth rates than other groups? It's because of the impact Islam has on women and girls. In many parts of the Muslim world, educating girls is frowned upon. Women having careers is frowned upon. So girls are married off at a young age and turned into baby-making machines. By the time a young woman in America has her first child when she's 25 years old, a young woman in Yemen is having her sixth child because she was married off when she was 11 or 12 years old. So are we supposed to conclude that Islam is true because it gives women and girls nothing to do apart from making babies? Notice, Every single reason you've been given to believe in Islam falls apart as soon as you take a closer look. Why, in the name of common sense, would you convert to a religion that requires you to submit yourself completely to the teachings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord, and that will sentence you to death if you ever change your mind, when the only reasons to accept the religion evaporate the moment you investigate them? In case you'd like to carefully examine Muhammad and the Quran before converting, I've included in the description box some links to articles and videos on all of the issues I brought up in this video. But maybe you'd like a second opinion. Maybe you'd like to hear from someone who was once a Muslim and had to learn all of this the hard way. The death threat from a Muslim preacher earlier in this video was a message to a young man who now calls himself the apostate prophet. He's an ex-Muslim who's under a death sentence for leaving Islam after realizing that it's false. Don't leave without clicking on his video and letting this former Muslim explain why you should think twice about converting to Islam. Hi everyone and welcome, this is the Apostate Prophet, I hope you're having a great day. If you are thinking of converting to Islam, then you may have heard a lot of things about Islam. If people want you to convert to Islam, they will only praise Islam. Because Muslims do not only have to believe in Islam, it is also their obligation to convert others. They will not accept that something about Islam could be wrong or bad, and they will react very strongly to criticism and to critics, especially to ex-Muslims like myself. It would be unwise, however, to only listen to the advocates and not to the critics. Converting to Islam requires you to fundamentally change your life and the way you think. It will be a decision that is awfully hard to reverse, and even if you want to change your mind afterward, you will find yourself forced to justify your conversion and to stay loyal to your decision. So, before you buy this product based on the good reviews, let me tell you about why I returned this product called Islam. I have talked a lot about what is wrong with Islamic theology and scripture. Today I want to talk about the main figure of Islam, 
Mohammed. Talking about Mohammed and reviewing him before joining or leaving Islam is so important because it is a core teaching in Islam that Muhammad is Allah's final and perfect messenger. It is required to believe in Allah and in Muhammad, to revere Muhammad and respect him, to obey him, to praise him when he's mentioned, and to love him more than anyone else. He is taught to be the perfect example for all humankind. Everything he did is good, and he must be followed and imitated. But where do we get this idea that Muhammad is perfect, the final messenger of Allah, and that he needs to be obeyed from? Primarily, Muslims get it from the Quran, the holy book of Islam. But why would we listen to the Quran? It is believed that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad through an angel, and Muhammad then recited those revelations over a span of 23 years to multiple people in his surrounding who memorized or took notes of those revelations. After Muhammad died, and many of those memorizers and scribes died too, his successors came up with the idea to compile all the remaining memories and notes and make it one book, which became the first Quran. And we know that all of this happened because we are told so in orally transmitted reports known as the Hadith, which were compiled in books known as the Hadith books generations after Muhammad. So, in short, we have these Hadith books whose authors tell us that person A said, that person B said, that person C said, that person D said, that person E said, that he went around to collect Quran verses from the minds and notes of many other people from the alphabet who listened to Muhammad who recited those verses to them. Oh, and of course, E collected all the right verses from these minds and notes and together with person F and person G, then accurately compiled the entire Quran and turned it into the book that we have today. And we are to trust all of that. All of this already calls into question the entire reliability and authenticity of the Quran and Islam. But if we did assume for the sake of the argument that all of this is indeed true and that everything went right in this process, then we have one more problem. Muhammad recited these verses, these revelations, over 20 years to his people after he supposedly received revelations through an angel which only appeared to him. But how exactly can we trust him? All we have is a man who tells us to obey a book which he himself claims to him was inspired to him by God. So, Muhammad tells us to obey the Quran, which tells us to obey Muhammad, who tells us to obey the Quran, which tells us to obey Muhammad, who tells us to obey the Quran, and so on. How do we know that we can trust Muhammad in all of this? If we look at Islamic traditions, we see that Muhammad used to hang out in a cave near Mecca, where he also received his first revelation. As reported, a giant, terrifying figure, the angel Gabriel, came to him and started giving the revelations to him. And he was very scared, he didn't know what was going on. He went home to his wife Khadija. It is said that her cousin Waraka, who converted to Christianity and who was studying the Bible, then told Muhammad that he must be inspired by God, and that this terrifying figure must be God's angel. Of course, that is what we know from reports, or from Muhammad himself. Neither this first inspiration nor this conversation can be documented. And we also don't know what Muhammad actually saw. We understand that Muhammad wanted to keep receiving these revelations, and he considered himself a messenger. When he wouldn't get these revelations, he would become extremely destructively depressed. According to some reports, he wanted to commit suicide and throw himself off a mountain. In other reports, once the angel did not appear to him, and he was very frustrated, and later that day he explained that the angel did not come to him because there was a dog in his house, and he then wanted the dog and all dogs in the city to be removed, and ordered dogs to be killed, which his followers followed. Muhammad was also not the best example. The Quran does make a rule that his followers, the Muslims, can marry up to four wives, but Muhammad himself had a dozen wives. For no reason, he didn't have to marry those people. He did permit his loyal followers to lie in order to deceive and kill one of his opponents who spoke ill of Muhammad, or who incited others to hate and oppose Muhammad. 
The supposed miracles that Muhammad performed in order to verify his prophethood are majorly two miracles. The splitting of the moon in his time and that he rode on the back of a horse-like animal to Jerusalem and then to heaven and back. For the moon splitting, we have absolutely no evidence from anywhere in the world, which already kind of discredits Islam's claim. And the other miracle, where he rode on the back of a horse to the sky, is also unproven because it reportedly happened while he was asleep in his bed. In scientific terms, we call that dreaming. Muhammad kept claiming that the end was near. He claimed that a child in his company would not grow old until the last hour would come. According to another report, he thought that an individual in his presence was the Dajjal, the Islamic equivalent of the Antichrist, who was expected to come before the end of the world. If Muhammad himself, who was supposedly constantly inspired and guided by Allah, said that, and he was clearly wrong about it, then how can we trust anything that he said? He married a child when she was six and had sex with her when she was nine. This is extremely hard to justify, I imagine, if you have not yet converted to Islam. The center of worship that he prayed towards, the Kaaba, which also all Muslims in the world pray toward, was a pre-Islamic pagan temple with no connection whatsoever to Abrahamic monotheism, no matter how much Islam tries to make that connection. It is no surprise that even according to the Quran's own admission and angry responses, people Polytheists in Muhammad's surroundings accused him of lying and of making up things as he goes, of contradicting himself and replacing Quran verses. Just because some people did believe in him due to political power and alliances, and maybe because his message was quite enticing for that 7th century region, we cannot simply accept him as a truthful prophet. No one has ever witnessed Muhammad's interactions with the angel and with Allah. All that we know is that Muhammad claimed to be inspired and these revelations and inspirations seemingly came as needed. If we trust him, why do we not trust many other self-proclaimed prophets who make similar prophecies and claims without any proof whatsoever? But as said, until we even get to Muhammad, we first have to trust that his successors actually did everything right and that is highly dubious. I'm only scratching the surface here. I have gone into detail very much before and I will keep doing so in the future. If you are seriously thinking of converting to Islam, then I recommend not only listening to those who want you to join, but I beseech you to also listen to those who have left Islam and those who criticize Islam. Also, leaving Islam carries the death penalty as Muhammad commanded it, so joining it and leaving it willingly is probably not a very pleasant idea. Thanks for listening. I have mostly focused on analyzing Muhammad and his reliability. If you want to learn more about the Quran's authenticity and the history of the Quran's preservation, please go and watch Islam Critique's video on this matter. I will link it here in the description and in the pinned comment. I will be back. Have a great day and stay away from Islam.